Titulayo Amihel. Sorry, are we still going? All right. Titulayo Amihel has worked as a psychotherapist and counselor for 16 years in a range of educational and corporate settings. She entered this profession after struggling with deep depression during her university days with no idea of the state she was in and merely internalizing it as being lazy, lazy and despondent. Unable to shift from that space, her beliefs kept her in a place of little faith of overcoming her laziness, lowering her self-esteem. But a college counselor helped her to label and identify these issues, which is what she'll be doing with us today. Stilayo specializes in supporting people struggling with debilitating stress, anxiety, and burnout, particularly to help them heal past traumas that may still haunt them in the present moment and may be the root cause of current addictions or physical ailments. The goal is to build self-care programs that facilitate recovery and rejuvenation. Obi Abuchi is an author and resilience coach who is incredibly passionate about personal leadership and the difference it makes to our lives. He is the CEO of Core, Core Leaders International. Core Leaders International is a leadership coaching and training business with the purpose to transform lives and create a better world by equipping leaders to lead from the inside out. The training enables people in leadership positions to be more resilient, overcome burnout, anxiety, and stress, and to lead with purpose and impact. The center of Obi's work is challenging our natural tendency to live our best lives by influencing and controlling our outer world before our inner world. Yet, great leadership comes from first managing our inner world with a foundation of personal leadership in place. And with that, I open the floor to our speakers, Obi and Titulayo. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Alex. Welcome, everyone. It's good to have you here. It is, it is. It's uh, fantastic to have a very international uh, crew on uh, this webinar. Uh, an absolute joy for Titi and I to be with you today. And we know uh, we are very excited about the things that we're going to share with you today because we know it's going to make a difference to your life, whether you are in a leadership position or not, you're influencing others, you're working as a professional, these are going to make um, an incredible difference to you. We live in a world today that is a VUCA world. And this is a, a term over the last three, four decades that has become ingrained in the business world in particular, and starting off with the military a world that our world is volatile. There's so much volatility going on in countries that's impacting political situations, economic situations. There's uncertainty, even in countries with robust economic and health institutions. COVID over the last couple of years reminded us that there is still so much that we cannot control. There is complexity. We're having to deal with big issues, climate change, systemic racism, political transformation, and there's ambiguity about how do we navigate all of these changes. And so life is throwing all sorts of challenges and pressures our way. As individuals, many of us can relate to some of the health challenges, financial challenges, work challenges, relational uh, challenges, competition, and, and then dealing with the pressure of political challenges. And, and what does this do to us? And why does it make a webinar like this so relevant for us? We are going to talk about some of the statistics and we are going to talk about the impact on our body. But I'd love to start off with something a bit more personal. And it's a story, actually a message that I got from a friend last year. It was a WhatsApp message. I've changed some of the content for confidentiality, of course, but this was pretty much the gist of it. Hey, Obi, sorry for my silence. I am in blah, blah, in hiding. 
I have got so much burnout that I just needed to get away from it all. Doing three jobs nonstop for two years, often keeping long hours, is not good for one's mental health. I'm finding that out the hard way. Sorry, but I had to share. I return to the UK at the end of the month. When I got this message from my friend, I was shocked and not shocked. I was shocked because this friend is a senior leader in an organization, high flyer, really high achiever. And at this point had been doing 80 plus hours a week for two years. And I'd interacted with him just the week before and he seemed to be doing just fine, really. Full of life, full of passion, and yet clearly he wasn't. And part of what shocked me was I felt, Obi, you're in this game, you should have known. And then I remembered that actually there was no way I could have known because it's not always obvious. And, and so many of us on this call either thinking about ourselves or thinking about people that we know can relate to this because on the outside, things seem great and we look great and we're suited and booted or whatever it is we wear. But on the inside, we're suffering or we're screaming or we're hurting. And part of the reason I know this isn't just because I work with leaders like this or individuals, it's because I've been there myself. And my friend's message actually took me back to a point in my life when I was in a similar place, launched my first book, my business, wrote my first book, but overextended financially. We were paying our mortgage on the credit card. We had our three boys already at that time. And I felt hopeless, I felt like a failure, I was contemplating suicide because the pressure was just too much. And oh, by the way, I was already a coach and an NLP practitioner at that time. And yet I had to acknowledge that the tools that I had gathered up until that point, the resources, the strategies, they just weren't enough. And I needed to go deeper. I had to take a deeper journey towards what I often call personal mastery and just really understanding what's going on in my body, what's going on in my mind, what's the neuroscience behind this that I really need to get, that I really need to engage with, that can help me not just have a know-how shift, have a skill shift, but have a mindset shift and be able to tell myself a different story. And so... That's why we're excited today, because TJ and I are going to set, share seven strategies with you that are going to help you just unlock more of your innate resilience and, and tackle stress, anxiety, and burnout. But before we go into the strategies, we're going to take a deeper look into what's behind mental health, what's behind stress, what's behind burnout. And for that, I'm going to hand over to TT. And trust me, you want to be taking notes and pay great attention to this uh, because it's really going to open up your mind to your inner world of what's going on uh, behind the scenes. So over to you, TT. Thank you, Obi. Thank you. And um, yes, just as you mentioned with your friend and with yourself, you are definitely not alone. I was in that space um, when I was in college as well as Alexander mentioned, where I was going through depression and I didn't even know that there was such a term. I didn't even know that there were symptoms for depression. And just as we see from these statistics, we're not alone. You know, there's a lot of stigma that is attached to having mental health issues. Um, and I mean, even just in this Zoom call, one in four or one in five of us will be struggling with a mental health condition either currently or in the past. Now, before you know, my spiritual African people jump at me, ah, I reject it. I, I don't claim that one in my life. Please hear me out because I know it's like, ah, to fiakwa. I don't take that one. There is something important about naming it and labeling it. As we see, I mean, even look at the statistics for Africa. If we just keep scrolling down, 
um, with all the stats. Mental health is going to increase by 15%. Um, by the year 2030. And the World Health Organization says that it will be the biggest burden out of all health conditions, including cancer, by the year 2030. So it's something that we really need to pay attention to and know that it's not something to be embarrassed about because most people are struggling with it one way or the other. And absolutely, we need to reframe our mindsets Yet at the core of neuroscientific research, it shows us that there's a region in your brain that gets fired when you name a problem and you validate that it exists. So what happens is when you name it and label it and acknowledge that it's there, it releases the hijack that happens in your body when you are stressed so that you can deal with the challenge more clearly. So mental health in itself is just the foundation of well-being. It is the effective functioning of us as individuals. It is not just the absence of a mental health sort of disorder. It's your ability to think, to learn, to understand your own emotions as well as the emotions of others. So it's really about a state of balance. Um, and it, the factors involved are your physical health, your psychological, social, cultural, and your spiritual um, factors affect um, this type of balance. So when you have a mental health challenge is because there's an imbalance of all these factors. And we're gonna talk about more of that as we carry on. So before we discuss um, mental health and what that might look like, let's go back a little bit on the next slide. So let's go back a little bit to the past. So now we are blessed to have a language for mental health where we can say we're anxious, we have counselors, we have psychotherapists, we have psychologists. But in the generations of the past, they had nothing really. There wasn't really a language for what you're going through and the symptoms. I mean, in some cultures, it was seen more as a spiritual thing. Like, you know, maybe you have um, a juju spirit or mami wata or, you know, so many different things that explained why someone was acting crazy, so to speak, right? Um, however, now, you know, when I, and so that's why now with my clients, I always ask them about the older generation because, and to even look back and see, well, did you notice anything in your own parents or is there anything in their own parents? Um, so Dr. Masaru, who is a Japanese pseudoscientist, did some research on how our thoughts and our emotions have impact on water. And in his experiments, it's really interesting, he exposed glasses of water to various words, to pictures and to music. Then he froze the water and he examined the crystals under a microscope. So he claims that positive words and emotions and even classical music and say positive prayer directed at the water produced beautiful crystals. While negative words and emotions or squishy music, I won't define what that is, produced uglier types of crystals. Why is this? Because water has memory and our human body is made of 60 to 70% of water. So I always ask about what it was like in your mother's womb. What, because research now, the Health Math Institute tells us that the brain waves of a mother are directly connected to the heartbeat of the fetus in the womb. I mean, think about that for a moment. Um, so all the thoughts and emotions that your mom experienced, you know, you would have experienced in the womb as well. And because water has memory and we're made up of water and you're in her womb, you would have felt all of that. Now, this isn't to induce mommy guilt, please block your ears from that, but it's just to show you that there is a generational impact on pain, on trauma. You know, when I'm with my clients, I ask the state of affairs of their mothers. Was she happy? Was she content? Was she fulfilled? Was she stressed? Was she bullied? Was she abused? Did she feel alone? Was she addicted to anything? And this isn't to judge or to analyze your parents. It's just to come in with, with um, a type of curiosity. Did you come, because it affects how you came out into the world. Did you come insecure? Were you uncertain? Did you feel worthy of being here? Or did the world feel like a scary space? Did you come knowing that you're confident that your needs that will be met? Or were you heightened and anxious? All these things are really important to know from your past. 
because your family history affects you now. Was there unresolved grief? Was there abuse of any kind? Was there unforgiveness? You know, you might even be struggling now and thinking, I find it so hard to forgive. It is possible that this could be something that's been passed down to you. So check with your parents, you know, were there any tribal wars? Were there any fa family members that they argued with? You know, was there anything even culturally right back to slavery um, that is affecting you possibly in present day? So all of this is just to take you back so that you can also start looking forward because these vibrations affect your heart and your heart is the seat of your emotions. So whatever is there from past or present, it's important to pay attention and just do a little check. So we're going to do that before we start today as we go on to our next slide. So just a little check-in, because as Obi said, we're going to be going to places that will trigger you, trust me. Even I, <laughs> who is doing this session, I hear certain things and woof, I'm like, man, that one hit hard. So we just want to check in, because this is all about mindfulness. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that. So I'd like to invite you um, to come into your, your space, to feel yourself in your seat, close your eyes if you're comfortable. And just bring yourself to your breath. You can place your hand on your heart and feel your heartbeat for five counts, just five counts, just to feel it. And as you're feeling your heartbeat, have a deep breath, feel the warmth of the breath as it goes in and out of your nostrils. And in this moment, just notice, notice your body. We're going to do a quick scan from the head to your toes. Do you notice any aches, any tension, any heaviness? We're not changing or judging anything. We're just noticing. So scan all the way down to your toes. See if there's anything there. Any gurgling sounds in your stomach? Any tension there? Now let's go back to your heart. Let's notice, are there any feelings here today? Are you tired? Are you anxious? Are you happy? Are you grateful? Are you sad? Are you angry about anything? Just notice what's happening with your heart today. And as you notice your heart, just want to picture a little white light coming out from the core of your heart and creating a little bubble around you. This bubble is your safe space. Nothing can penetrate this bubble. Whenever you feel activated at any points in this webinar, in this bubble, you are safe you are protected and you are loved. So we're just going to take a deep del be uh, belly breath. And you might just sigh it out. <sighs> the last one, deep belly breath in. <sighs> Knowing that you are safe, protected and you are loved. When you're ready, you can open your eyes. Okay, so this is just a little practice. It literally takes two minutes to pause in the day and it's a grounding technique, you know, before you have webinars or before you're out there going to work or you're just taking a little breath, a uh, little break, just do this practice to help ground you. Okay, so on the next slide, we're going to do a little check-in. How is your engine running? How are you fueling your body? How are you managing your responsibilities, your family, your work? What habits have you developed in order to cope with your current lifestyle? We're going to do a little poll and fill out as many as apply to you. Again, you know, we're not judging, we're just taking stock of where we're at.
we often use some of these activities to soothe ourselves. And in a minute, we'll get the results for that. Let's see what's happening with everyone. You know, we're not alone. Sometimes we hide these habits because we think, oh, nobody else does this. It's just me. And, you know, in this time, we really want to acknowledge what these things are. So we'll just wait for those results. Most times when I'm meeting with my clients, we use an approach called acceptance and commitment therapy. And the idea of acceptance and commitment therapy is that you validate whatever experience you have without judgment and you feel it. And so acceptance and commitment therapy recognizes that most pain and suffering stems from an ongoing battle to eliminate pain. So of course, nobody wants to wake up in the morning and feel like, oh yes, I'm gonna enjoy pain today. No, we want to escape from it and we're going to use whatever habit or self-soothing strategy to calm our nerves. Okay, we're just waiting for the results from Obi. Right. <laughs> yes, Netflixing and movies. That's the top one these days because there's so many series to watch and we're trying to catch up on. So I am not alone in that one. That was one of mine. 71% of people watch movies and then it goes to exercise, eating, staying up late. Yeah, because that's usually the time where it's quiet. And maybe you, you've been working all day and you just want a moment to yourself. So that's quite a common one as well. Okay, thank you, Obi, for that. So on our next slide, we'll talk about the foundation of how to fuel our tanks in the right way. Now, I love Lynn Namka's definition of resilience because it's about building your bounce back muscles. I used to work as a school counselor in an international school in Beijing. And whenever kids come in, you know, I would help them with their transitioning. And a lot of anxious parents, you know, they always make this statement, you know, kids are resilient and they will cope. And yes, I definitely agree with that. However, if you don't teach children effective tools on how to manage, you know, transitioning to a new environment, to so even acknowledge the anxiety they're feeling, the fact that they're worried about making new friends, they will struggle to navigate their educational environment. And that is the same for us as adults. You know, the Heart Math Institute defines resilience as your capacity to prepare for, to recover from, and adapt in the face of stress, adversity, or challenge. And your capacity is spread between your physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual energy. So for your inner battery to be fully charged, you need to consider what drains you. Now, the part that we don't, we're not able to quantify is your emotional energy. And that is the part that drains you the most. That could be past emotions or that could be present emotions. So for you to be equipped with effective self-regulation coping skills, you need to be able to efficiently manage your inner battery so that you can build the bounce back muscles in the face of adversity and stress. So let's talk about self-regulation, but that starts with awareness. So on the next slide, we're going to look at the differences between stress and burnout. So stress is not all bad. Stress is our body's natural response to pressure. And there are many different situations or life events that can cause stress. It is often triggered when we experience something new, as I mentioned with you know, children transitioning into schools, or something unexpected, or it threatens your sense of self, you know, if someone is degrading you or patronizing you in some kind of way, or when we feel we have little control over a situation. And I, I can imagine that for most of us during COVID, our financial situations have just been up and down. So of course, there will be a lot of stress there. Burnout, on the other hand, is quite different. Burnout is more about prolonged stress. So it's important not to confuse burnout with stress. Stress is more about having too much on your plate. So too much work to handle, too many responsibility, too many hours spent working. Burnout is quite the opposite. You know, you typically feel like you don't have enough. So you don't have enough motivation, you don't have enough energy, or you don't have enough care. 
burnout tends to also be more work related. Um, and I include mothers and fathers who work from home. And I, I mean, stay at home moms and dads, you know, because that is a different kind of work, even if you're not getting paid for it, um, necessarily, it is a form of burnout that you can have as well. So some of the causes of burnout are having a heavy workload, having um, a poor work-life balance, um, dealing with distressing situations, particularly when you're lacking autonomy in the workplace, uh, where you're being micromanaged, um, not being sufficiently rewarded, and that's typical. That doesn't only have to be monetary, but in affirmations, um, in appreciation as well in the workplace, being in an unsupportive environment and experiencing unfairness or discrimination. So you may be at higher risk of burnout, particularly if you already feel like your self-esteem is low, or you know there might be unrealistic expectations in the workplace or at home, <laughs> or you're not comfortable with you're not able to cope with the stresses that are coming your way. So you also may be experiencing burnout at a higher rate if your job requires a heavy workload. This is the part where your boundaries, boundaries are your needs and um, what make you feel safe and comfortable in, in an environment. So it's the expectations in your relationships and your environment. So when you don't have strong boundaries, and you have a heavy workload, of course, you're going to go into burnout, especially if at the workplace, and this happened a lot in schools, is where it's understaffed. You know, you find that one person is carrying the load of so many people. And of course, this creates conflicts in the workplace. And um, if you're not getting appreciated or rewarded for what you do, this builds up into a prolonged amount of stress. Now, there are ways to measure burnout. Uh, there's Dr. Maslach who created the Maslach Burnout Inventory, and there were three ways that she could determine through this inventory whether you are in burnout or not. There's emotional exhaustion, uh, and so this measures how affected and drained you are by the stress that you're experiencing. There's depersonalization, where you get desensitized. I was talking to someone the other day um, who I was serving, and it was um, someone in telemarketing. And he was just like, one time a client called and he was like, I just don't care. Whether you like it or you don't like it, leave me alone. I have enough stress. He didn't say this out loud, <laughs> but in his mind, he was like, please next. And you just start to lose the care and empathy for your customers. This can happen to you at home as well, where something's going on with a family member and you are just switched off because you have nothing left to give. Sometimes teachers tell me that some of my clients who are teachers, they feel bad because they go into work and those inner values, which Obi will be clarifying for us, clarifying for us later, you just forget about those and you just think, I just want to go home. I just want to rest. And you, you're just not in the mood to give as much as the kids are asking for. So that's an important indication of when you're in burnout is that you lose a certain sense of empathy. Then there's also personal accomplishments. Um, this measures how confident you feel in performing your, your role. So um, this happens with compassion fatigue, particularly with social workers, mental health workers, doctors, nurses, spiritual leaders um, as well. You can struggle with compassion fatigue because you are so exhausted. And you know you can start to lose the satisfaction of what you're doing. And if you're in that space, you're probably in a state of burnout. So difference between stress and burnout, stress is having too much, burn, burnout is not having enough. And let's talk about depression because depression on the other hand affects every aspect of your life. And it's a persistent feeling of hopelessness, worthlessness, and helplessness. Now, remember I said to you in the beginning, um, going to see my college counselor, thank God I went to see her because I was experiencing a lot of it. Well, except for the food one. Me, yeah, I like my food, you know, Nigerian woman. <laughs> so the food one, I didn't experience, but most of the other ones, definitely I was experiencing it for at least three months or so. At its most severe, depression can lead to suicide. And we've all talked about that, right? 
I want to add a new meaning to suicidal ideation um, because I think there is quite a stigma in talking about it. And I really appreciate Obi's openness and also other people who come out and say, yes, I have struggled with this. If we look at the animal kingdom and we think about a gazelle who is caught by a lion. Now, this gazelle is um, just about escaping the jaws of this lion because another predator is coming around and the lion gets scared. So typically what it does is it pretends like it's dead. It just freezes, right? And it goes limp and loose and it even flops his head because it wants to pretend to the predator that it is dead. If it is able to fight the pre predator, it might try in the beginning, but for this moment when it's frozen, it just plays dead. There's another part where that is called fawning, where the animal will try to take care or accommodate the aggressor to keep themselves safe. So, so just to make the lion feel good, it will just pretend dead, it will do, it, you know, just do whatever the lion says so that um, the lion can be satisfied. Now, this might sound a little familiar to you, you might have had a parent or a carer or a person in authority that you were often trying to appease, even if you were in an unsafe and uncomfortable situation. But the prolonged buildup of this type of stress and danger, it leads to symptoms which um, really cause so much burden on your body. So with suicidal ideation or with suicidal thoughts, it is because your body has experienced so much hopelessness, so much tiredness, and so much stress that it's thinking it's time to prepare for death. It's time to just pack up because you've had enough, right? And in that moment of packing up, it only takes an instance. You know, it's recently, I mean, in 2019, uh, Miss USA, she was a lawyer. She, she was high functioning. And you can be high functioning and highly depressed. It's not just like if you're tired and you can't get out of bed, you can be super busy and be highly depressed. Unfortunately, she jumped from the 29th floor and she was only 30 years old. Her parents later mentioned in interviews that she struggled with deep depression. May her soul rest in peace. But this story is not uncommon. If we leave these symptoms for too long and if we stay in that vibration of shame because of judgment of other people or even judgment of ourselves, we prevent ourselves from getting the help that we need. You know, in Africa, we say that unless you sleep in someone's bed, you have no idea what they're going through. So really during these times, it's, it's time for self-compassion, whether it's for yourself or others. We often look at people and say, ah, how can they do such a thing? Well, if you are deeply depressed, it doesn't take much for you to start to think I'm preparing for death, just like that gazelle. The hope is that, you know, and when the gazelle, if, if by luck, the lion goes away, the gazelle will first start to breathe. They still don't move, right? They start to breathe first, and then they have to shake their bodies and then get up and run. So coming out of depression, it's not like a, a quick fix. You have to really learn to look after yourself. You have to really learn to speak. And we'll be talking more about some ways of coping with that as we go along. OK, just a quick check in, because sometimes when we talk about that, some of us may have experienced people who have gone through that or we have experienced it ourselves. So just kind of move and shake your body. Just shake it off. Remind yourself of your name or names. I have many names. Enatiti Lyo Bintu Ajoke. I'm in fact there are many, you know, bless my mom. <laughs> so just remind yourself of your name and shake it off because we need to move it to lose it. Okay. So stress cycle. How do we start to manage um, these symptoms that we might experience from stress and burnout? So you start with a stressor. I'm going to use an example of bugs. When I was in boarding house, um, yeah, there were some roaches around <laughs> and they were not pleasant. And till this day, I mean, it's kind of alleviated now. I've always, there's always been this kind of phobia of cockroaches. So I see a cockroach and then the thing that comes to my mind is, oh my gosh, this is a tiny thing, right? But I just think this thing is just going to crawl over me and it's so disgusting. The feeling in my body 
is an intense kind of closing up. Um, I feel disgusted in my emotions. I feel like this is so irritating, annoyed that I'm actually in a situation where there's a roach next to me. And of course, the natural thing I do is, ah, or I run away, right? Now, there's something called, um, Tony Robbins calls it neuroassociative conditioning. During that time in my life um, was a time where I was separated from my mom for a long time. So of course I was in grief, I was in loss. There were all these new people that I had to adjust to and it was an, a new environment, an uncomfortable situation. So when you are in these situations and there's already some kind of pain or trauma happening to you at the same time, that item, that stressor, the cockroach, becomes a reminder in your immune system that there is danger. So I was going through my trauma and my loss, but the cockroach then became that conditioning that says, every time you see a cockroach, the neural pathways in my body say, right, it's time to react because of the stress that I was feeling. So on our next slide, we'll look a little bit more at these helpers in the brain. These um, helpers in the brain that help us react in times of danger. So I'm only using these three. I mean, we have a complex sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system that plays into all of this. And Obi will be describing some of this as well. But these were the ones that I taught children in school because I wanted to teach them to have empathy, to know that when that child comes to you and says you are stupid or an idiot and you want to whack them in the face, it's not just because you're a bad person, it's because there are mechanisms in your brain and your body that is telling you you're in danger and therefore you're supposed to react. So if I ask you where your brain is, you'll say it's in your skull. If I ask you where your mind is, if I ask you where your mind is, just then you would have gone to the clapping of my hands, right? So your mind is wherever you place your focus. So I teach children that the front part of their brain is the part that helps them to focus. And you actually have control over that because your brain is a muscle. Neuroplasticity tells us that our brain is flexible. So you can change and reframe your mind. Your prefrontal cortex is like your wise leader, is it? like your guru. It's the part that helps you solve problems. It helps you concentrate and it helps you to have clarity in your decision-making process. The amygdala, on the other hand, is the oldest part of the brain and it's formed, the first part that is formed in your mother's womb. Now the amygdala does not think like the prefrontal cortex. It just reacts, fight, flight, freeze, fawn. That is the way that it reacts. It sees danger, it's like your security guard. And it's there to tell you, hey, it's time to run guys, or it's time to, to react, or it's time to freeze and surrender. Again, this amygdala is the part that is formed in your mother's womb. And this is why I always take um, the history of the state of affairs of your mother. Because if your mother was in a constant state of anxiety or stress, guess what? The amygdala in your brain in the mother's womb will constantly feel like that. So when you come out in the world and you're scared or you're a really colic baby or a crying baby, it's probably because you've absorbed that in the womb, you were in stress. Please, again, ignore mommy guilt, please. This is not to make people feel bad. I've had my experience you know, with my own son. I could trace his anxiety to my state of affairs. And yep, I feel mommy guilt about that a lot, but it also informs me and gives me empathy for why he reacts a certain way. He used to grind his teeth when he was a baby so loud, but I knew it's because during that period I was going through a lot and I was anxious, right? So when everybody was like, oh, why is he doing this? Oh, why can't he swim? Or why can't he do this? I just knew that, yo, <laughs> you do not know what this kid has been under, right? So Let's leave him alone because I get it. Now he jumps off waterfalls and he does all these crazy things that I'm like, God, please, I beg, save this child though. Because he was given the empathy and the understanding from young that it's okay that you're this anxious, right? So that's what the amygdala does. It helps you um, in times of danger. The hippocampus is your memory saver. It saves all your negative and positive assist, um, um, associations and memories from the past and in the present. So remember that bug I told you about? So I see a cockroach in present day and a grown woman like me at age 42. 
I'm jumping because my hippocampus doesn't know what's real or imagined. It just remembers that, oh, we see a cockroach, we jump, right? And we're scared because of all the stresses that were involved at that time. So we know all of this. Um, we use these mechanisms in, this, in the brain as a way of showing empathy for why we react the way that we react. So let's make it a little bit more personal. This fight, flight, freeze response. Think about yourself for a moment. When you are stressed or when you are anxious, um, how do you respond? Just embrace it. We're not judging it. Just think, what's your default way of responding? So acceptance and commitment therapy says, acknowledge it and know that you're just being triggered. Daniel Siegel on the next slide describes this as flipping your lid. So when you flip your lid, it's not just because you're angry. You flip your lid um, when you're also when you when you're running away or when you you're freezing or you're you're kind of surrendering in, in a certain situation. And that's more about your coping styles. So if we look on the next slide, we tend to have a default way of responding to situations. Now, it's not like it's just one for each person. Of course, we fluctuate in and out of all these coping styles. But it's just good to note, you know, so as an employee at work, are you more surrendered? So anything your boss says, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, or um, when inside you, you should have some more boundaries because, you know, this is an uncomfortable situation or an unsafe situation. But you might just go surrendered or you might have a partner who you're always talking to, but just never listens. And you're like, what is happening with this person? Maybe because they've decided to avoid, you know, maybe if it's a guy, he's thinking, ah, beg, I don't want your wahala. I don't want your stress. And he just blanks out and avoids the situation. You might be a counterattacker like me. You know, that's my default. Um, <laughs> I want to fight. <laughs> and um, particularly for leaders also, this is important because when you feel threatened um, by your employees or you feel or whether it's in, in a religious setting or it's in your family and you feel like I'm the boss, right? And no one gets to challenge you. You might tend to react by counter attacking and being defensive. So let's look at a case study and see how that pans out. So Simon is a male entrepreneur and we're using a pseudo name for confidentiality. And he's in his early 40s. So again, we take his family history just to know how he's grown up. What were the family dynamics? What were the conflicts he faced? He was the first born in his family and he had to be responsible you know, for everybody else's needs before his own. He also grew up in a faith-based home with very, very high moral standards. And um, he was very close in his relationship with his higher source. So the first steps we had to take was to identify his internal and external stresses. This is important, you know, because it's not just the bugs or the noise or, you know, the things on the outside, like your own internal stresses can get triggered. And this is the part where I was mentioning that you cannot quantify your emotional energy. And this side of the internal stresses can be exhausting. So particularly for Simon, it was noise. And the reason why this was a stressor for him was because he grew up in a big family and there was always noise and commotion happening. So whenever his kids were watching TV or just doing their regular things, shouting or fighting, and he was in the house, he would be so triggered. His internal stresses where he had very high expectations of themselves First bones out there, I feel for y'all because usually you're, you're the first, right? So everyone's testing everything for the first time with you. And so there are high expectations. You know, he never felt like anything he did was good enough. You know, he was always aiming for perfection because he wasn't really given that much grace when he made mistakes. And oftentimes, you know, as parents, if we carry our own shame or our own expectations of what our children should be like, we project that onto our first bones, especially guilty, you know, I've done it, you know, as well. So 
we had to help him really understand this side of himself. Then we looked at his stress cycle on the next slide. Of course, we looked at his thought patterns, his physical, his emotions, and his behavior. So looking at his thought patterns, um, one of the things that he was worried about was in China, a new wave of the virus had hit again. So of course, in his practice, he was worried. You know, He felt stuck and unmotivated because there was so much going on. We have a very strong storytelling mind that deals with facts and perceptions and also positive and negative emotions. So the types of things he was thinking about, he would often go to the worst case scenario. So whenever I talk to my, uh, my clients, I always say it's a snowball effect. It starts as something small and then it builds up to something huge, also known as catastrophizing. So will I be able to provide for my family? What if there's no business out there? I'm not coping, I'm a fraud. There's the imposter syndrome that kicks in. What if I haven't got it in me? Um, and if I don't make it here and now, will I ever make it if I leave this country? And so we had to really help him think about what he is thinking about. That's metacognition. When you think about what you're thinking about, then you can reframe the pattern. You can dejunk your mind so that you find what's really happening. Talking therapy is great for this, right? Your left brain and your right brain needs to integrate when you're storytelling. If you stay on your left brain, which is linear, it's logical, it's linguistic, or you stay too much on your right brain, which is emotional, you stay stuck. Whereas when you tell the story in, in a structural sense and you put the emotions in with it, you integrate it so that it releases the power of the emotions and experience that you have with it. So your storytelling is a way of bringing your unconscious thoughts to your subconscious and your conscious mind because you need to feel it to heal it, right? So I always encourage worry time. I know some people say, oh, don't worry, don't worry, but actually spend time thinking about what you're thinking about because then after you know what is in there, you can dejunk and then you can reframe. So let's go to the physical. So look at the symptoms here. See if you identify with any of this. Our body is always trying to send us messages, always, 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 but we ignore it. You know, we sit, we live such a sort of sedentary lifestyle and you can sit at the desk for a long time, not even notice that little shoulder pain that's happening or the back pain that's happening. And so with, uh, with Simon, we had to really look and identify what, it, what his body was telling him. Sometimes you might even have psychosomatic symptoms. You go to the doctor and they say, ah, nothing is wrong, go. And you're like, but this pain is debilitating. Are you sure nothing is wrong? It possibly is because it's been something that's been prolonged. You know, being exposed to stress for a, a long amount of time has built up into this symptom. So for Simon, his skin on his forehead would often get dry before he goes to sleep. And he would experience a lot of knee pain. And then he would also experience um, tightness in his chest. Now, the interesting thing about the tightness in his chest is he didn't even know that they were panic attacks. He was having mini panic attacks almost every single day. And they will last for about a minute or two where he's sweating, he can't breathe. Um, he feels like he's going to die literally, right? But in his mind, he's like, okay, it's gonna pass, it's gonna pass, it's gonna pass. And then it does pass and he carries on. Now, identifying this was big because, um, you know, and, and it's always really important to check because you could be having some kind of heart attack or it could be a panic attack. So seeing something when you experience a tightness in your chest or you go through anything over two minutes or three minutes, please go and get help. Okay, that is not healthy to stay in that state for a prolonged period of time. And so by identifying these symptoms, he was able to realize that, okay, when I'm feeling anxious or stressed, there's specific parts in my body that affect me. And this is important to know, like different you know, emotions kind of get stored in your body in different places. So you might be experiencing grief and you feel it in your back. You might be experiencing anxiety, you feel that in your guts. The more versed you are in what these symptoms are, the more you're able to say, ah, oh, you know what? 
I think I'm feeling lost. That's why this back pain is happening. Let me just stay in that grief and identify what's happening and release it. Or, man, I'm feeling really angry right now with my boss and I feel that in my chest. You know what? Let me offer myself compassion and deal with this anger in my chest. So it's, your body is just always giving you signals about what's happening. Let's look at what is happening underneath the iceberg. So we need to have a more nuanced emotional vocabulary other than mad, sad, and glad, right? Because <laughs> those things, and it, the default we go to is I'm angry. I'm frustrated, I'm annoyed, do you know why? Because those are comfortable emotions. They don't involve a level of vulnerability. Like the other day, you know, we got a puppy recently and my children just spend so much time with this puppy. They don't even come to say hello to me when they come into the house. And my daughter asked, she was like, oh, why are you acting funny? And I paused for a moment. I said, I'm feeling jealous. And she was like, oh, really? I was like, yeah, I'm feeling jealous. But it felt so vulnerable. Ugh. Even when I said it, I was like, Ugh. I hate that. <laughs> but I was, I was feeling jealous. Um, but when we're able to kind of really think about the more vulnerable feelings that we're feeling, then we can name it and we can release it. So for Simon, at the time, he was feeling stifled. He was feeling helpless. He was overwhelmed, you know, really with the situation that he was in. And he, he needed to be able to name those specific emotions. So let's go to signs and symptoms of his anxiety. So as we see here, we have our psychological symptoms, physical and behavioral. Simon was always irritable. Um, he, and one of the ways that he showed that was he was just really clingy. He was always kind of wanting affection and wanting attention from his partner, but she was quite oblivious to this. And so she would often ignore him. Uh, at the same time, he also wanted space and time to be alone because he was absorbing a lot of stress from his environment. As a result of this, um, he was started to feel muscle aches and tension on his body. So we had to identify where exactly he felt this in his body. And it was particularly on his left shoulder. It was only there for some reason. <laughs> uh, and because of all these symptoms, Simon started to drink. He started to drink before bed. Um, he started to drink when he finished work and it became one of those habits to help him calm down his body. Drinking is not bad. It's just when it's excessive and when it becomes more of a coping, coping mechanism because you're avoiding the pain and you're not even aware of what is happening for you. So again, with acceptance therapy, we were able to identify these things without shaming him about his drinking problem because there were some unmet needs that he was experiencing. So on the next slide, let's do a check-in about that. These are Tony Robbins again. He identified these different needs. And if you click again, we will see the needs that Simon had. He had a need for certainty, for connection, for growth. And um, certainty, of course, because he was building this business and with the virus and everything happening, he couldn't, I mean, before we could always say, oh, we're going to travel here and we're going to do this and we're going to build this. But with COVID, <laughs> that just went out, the, out, out of place, right? Because there was so much uncertainty. We, 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 he just didn't know what to do. Then he had a deep need for connection from the people around him, whether his kids, particularly from his partner. More for his partner to understand what he was going through. And of course, the need for growth. Now, if we put it all together, can you imagine Simon feeling the stressor of the noise, getting irritated with his family, feeling frustrated, feeling the symptoms in his body, and through knowing about his stress cycle, instead of just allowing his amygdala to react by counterattacking, he's able to say to his partner, I feel triggered when there's a lot of noise in the house. I'm feeling helpless in this moment because I don't know if I can achieve my financial goals. And in my thinking process, I feel like I'm a failure. 
I start to have intense chest pains and panic attacks, and I want to escape by drinking. Right now, I have a need for certainty, growth, and empathy through deeper connection. I would really appreciate some quiet time in the house for one hour and some quality time with you so that you understand what I'm going through. So Simon was able to do and say all of that to his partner because he understood his stress cycle. Tall order, I hear some of you say like, man, who has time? <laughs> who has time for grandma or a bag? Please go and sit down somewhere, John. <laughs> That's, you know, most times you're just like, look, yo, get this right, go into your room or be quiet, or you just don't want to be thinking about big grandma, as we call it in Nigeria. <laughs> However, when you understand your stress cycle, you don't even have to say all of that. Self-awareness, just even having the awareness in yourself helps you to respond rather than react. So what happens when you ignore your needs and you ignore the symptoms, you reach your tipping point? Research has showed us that when we're dehydrated, we've already been thirsty for a long time. And that's the same for us with our emotions. By the time you reach your tipping point, you've been in burnout or debilitating stress for a good amount of time. So let's see what a tipping point typically looks like. Next slide. So remember the statistics that we showed earlier? Well, when there is an imbalance, we talked about the psychological, physical, cultural, all those factors. When there's an imbalance in your mental health, these are the things that happened. You know, you have generalized anxiety, which is diagnosed usually after six months. If you have persistent symptoms of depression, it's diagnosed after two weeks. In my case, my high anxiety, I had phobias um, that became uh, conditioned inside of me. You might have anxiety with your health and there's so much more out there, you know, with PTSD, those are buried memories because it's too painful. And sometimes you get triggered in present day from something that you, you just have no awareness about and you think, where is that coming from? Sometimes that's a, a reaction from PTSD. Vicarious anxiety is an important one, you know, um, pastoral care, those in pastoral care or leaders in organizations or highly sensitive and empathic people uh, are affected by this. So you absorb rather than absorb, um, observe, sorry. <laughs> you absorb rather than observe other people's emotions. Okay, let's do a quick check-in on the next slide. Where are you at? So this is the stress curve. We're going to do another poll. and just say where you are. Let's see where we all are today. And we'll just wait to see um, what Obi has for us there. Are you in fatigue? Are you in exhaustion, anxiety, panic, breakdown? Remember, there's no right or wrong. You might even be at a stage where you're in that preparing for death because you're so stressed. Let's just be honest, it's just a check-in. And we'll see that we're not alone, right? The poll will show us that we are not alone. 60% of us in this webinar feel like we have too much stress. And 20% are, were able to identify that we are in burnout. Thank you for sharing that. And thank you for being honest about where you are at. So to finish from our side on the next one, the next slide, it's just a check-in, you don't have to do this right now, but in your own stress cycle, you might just share in the chat, what is one stressor that you are experiencing right now? One stressor, is it finances? Is it a relationship? 
Is it family dynamics? <laughs> is it bugs like me? Who knows? But just take notice and then in your own time, go through the stress cycle for yourself. Okay, I'm gonna hand over to Obi now. Spoken a lot. <laughs> Hey, Titi, you say spoken a lot, but spoken so much incredible stuff. And, and I do want to acknowledge as well, just as you have, thank you to everyone who shared, responded to that last poll and acknowledged where you are at. And even though I, I do this on a regular basis and, and work with leaders and we talk about a lot of these uh, issues, it, it can be heavy at this point. And so you might, even right now, having acknowledged that, be feeling heavy. And it's been important to really unpack and Tita's done a wonderful job just doing that, just really giving a picture of, hey, what's going on behind the scenes? What's happening beneath the surface? What's going on inside of us. I often say to leaders all the time, when life squeezes you and the pressure is on, what you're like on the inside will come out. I don't care how you're suited and booted, what you're really like. If you're not in touch with those stresses, you're not aware of all of that anxiety, you're not aware of the different things that trigger you, on the inside, if there's anxiety, there's fear, there's doubt, there's self-deprecation, all of that, under pressure, it will come out. So just want to acknowledge that and, and celebrate you for acknowledging where you're at. Just before we move into the seven strategies, I'm going to ask you to take a deep breath. Take it in. Just as we had a check-in with your heart earlier on, an opportunity to, to do that again and just, hey, you are okay. And now for next 10, 15 minutes, what we wanna do is say, if that's the reality for a lot of us, experiencing that challenge, experiencing that stress and pressure, then what can we do about it? How can we tackle that? And the seven strategies we're gonna share with you will help with this. The first one is, this and Titi mentioned it earlier on. When you're not clear about your values, you're not clear about your boundaries, and that ends up causing a lot of stress. And so, the first strategy is to really align your life around a clear set of values. As individuals, when we're when we're focused on the things that are most important to us, that's when we get a greater sense of resilience, and we feel a greater sense of purpose and, and passion. When you're not living in alignment with your values, then you end up spending most of your time and energy doing things that aren't important to you, that aren't meaningful, and that causes uh, a lot of stress. And so I often work with individuals and say, so do you know what you stand for? Do you know what's important to you? And therefore, are you able to say no to the things that aren't? Are you able to say, hey, it's 6.30 right now. I'm shutting the laptop. I'm shutting my phone off. I'm going to be present with my family because that's really important to me. And that gives me um, energy. Now, there's also some neuroscience that I want us to talk about. So there's a part of our brain called the reticular activating system that connects to the base of your brain from your spinal cord. And it's got a compact bundle of neurons. They're different shapes and sizes. And it acts as a, as a gatekeeper for the information around us. So you know when you are looking to buy a car and then all of a sudden you set your mind on a specific car, you see that car all over the place. You think, how come everyone else is interest or suddenly driving that car? Well, that's the reticular activating system because our conscious mind can only process so much information so we are filtering out information all of the time but when we focus in on something then we see it and the reticular activating system helps us stay focused on what's most important our values are like that our values help us stay focused on what's most important and what really gives us uh, energy and what happens though when 
we're not clear about our values, when we're not living in alignment to them. Well, a lot of what we've talked about already, and here's a, I want to bring this to a global example so you can see how this can impact people, thousands of people. So here's an organization. They had these values, respect, integrity, communication, and excellence at an organizational level. The leaders signed up to them on paper. This is how they were living. The reality, though, was a completely different story. And for those of you who are old enough, you can cast your mind back to 2001, December, the Enron organization, whose leaders said, these are our values, this is what we live by. In reality, they were living by these values. They weren't living in alignment with what was important to them as an organization and also important to them as individuals. And sadly, this caused 20,000, just over 20,000 employees lost their jobs. $74 billion was lost because leaders weren't living their values. And when we know our values as individuals, we're able to course correct. As I've said already, it keeps us just really anchored. We know what our boundaries are, and then we're able to, to leave a legacy that counts. Now, how do you work out? How do you be really clear about your values? Well, not to be morbid, we've already talked about uh, preparing for death, but there's a really powerful way of just projecting to imagining our funeral and thinking about what do you want your loved ones? What do you want colleagues to say? What do you want friends, people that you have impacted? What would you want them to say about you is an incredible way of being really clear about how do I want to live? How do I want to show up? What are the things that really excite me, give me energy, give me purpose? And I want to focus on doing those things. Now, surprise, surprise, I've actually written my eulogy from the perspective of my boys and from the perspective of my wife. My wife doesn't like the fact that I've written it, but I've written it anyway. And it's a really powerful way of being super clear about Obi, who am I? What do I stand for? What's important to me? What gives me energy day to day? So that's the first strategy. The second one I want to talk about is cultivating rewarding habits. So every day, right, every single day, we get up, we make decisions about what we're going to do, brush teeth, put clothes on, go get a, a latte wherever you are, get a hot chocolate, go to some buka, you know, get some meat pie, whatever it is, right? I mean, we all have our different uh, things. That, and we think that oh, we're being purposeful, we're being considered about those choices. The reality is a lot of our habits are automatic. They're all automatic because our brain can't handle us thinking about all of these decisions. So it becomes uh, automatic. And, and they're really powerful ways of when they're done right, we can get energy from those and they influence um, our attitude. So our habits can be both a blessing and a curse. When they're really positive habits, they can be a blessing, they energize us. When they're negative habits, they can be a curse because they de-energize us. Someone once said, our habits determine our future. And they do that because they shape our character, both at a mental level, physical level, behavioral level. So some of the questions I often get clients to ask is, what habits can you integrate in your life that maximize your energy? And referring back to the poll or already at the beginning, there are some things that we're doing that even though it's distressing for us, it's actually taking away energy. So here's just a simple uh, chart. So the, you've got the block on the left. These are some things that drain energy. Some people say, I want to get a lot done. So I'm going to, I'm going to write this email. I'm going to chat with my colleague. I'm going to make a call. I'm going to do some cooking all at the same time. And hey, it just doesn't work. I am overloading myself. And oh, here's another thing for those of you that love audiobooks and you say, hey, I'm going to read this at five times the speed and I'm going to get it all and I'm going to, and oh, forget reading the full book. I'm going to just read the bite sized chunks and I'm going to get it and overload my brain. That is um, doing more harm than good. Ruminating on the negative, excessive time on social media. If you're the sort of person, the first thing in the morning you get up, it's like, hey, how many likes did I get on that? 
that is um, draining energy, things that give us energy, mindfulness. I think Rach said earlier on, positive affirmations, meditating, those sorts of things. Deep focus on a specific task gives us um, energy. Here are just three or two in particular that I wanna just draw your attention to. Just the habit of reflection. At the end of the day, so I've got the, on my phone at six o'clock every day, I've got a reminder that just says, hey, Obi, ask yourself this question. What have you achieved today that you are proud of? And just taking the time to reflect at the end of the day. Most of us are in the habit of, oh, that's it. I finally set that last email. Now I've got to go get the train. Oh, I've got to go jump on a bus and do this. And like, okay, it's now it's time to start cooking or being with the family, but just integrating a habit in your life. Okay, I'm going to reflect on today, not on the, oh, what are all the things that went wrong? But hey, what did I achieve today that I'm really proud of? Just really keeps your mind focused on the positive, what you're learning, how you're growing, keeps you grounded. The second habit that's a great one is just the habit of gratitude. I mean, some people describe this as a superpower. And the reason this is critical is our mind has a negativity bias, and I'll share that shortly. And so we can really focus on the negative, but when you integrate the habit of gratitude in your life, hey, what am I grateful for every single, end of the day, what am I grateful for? Who am I grateful for? Who do I need to send a thank you text to? You are training your mind to be optimistic, to see positives, to smell the roses. And yes, there are thorns, but you're training your mind to see the positives. And so that's a great habit to get into. Third strategy I want to share with you, and then I'm going to hand over to Titi, is just empowering beliefs nurturing, empowering beliefs in our lives. Here's the thing, what you believe about yourself, the talk, that self-talk, that what's going on in your mind, what you're saying about yourself, it influences how you show up. And I'm gonna show how it not only influences just how you show up, but also it's influencing the hormones that are being released um, in your body. So there are some questions we can ask what are some of the beliefs I have that are either hindering my effectiveness or propelling me forward? I want to take this a bit further just to show you the power of beliefs. Think about things like the slave trade or the Holocaust or 9-11 or 7-7 here in the UK. All of those things happen just because people believed a certain thing. But it Beliefs also work positively, right? Because you had the Wright brothers who believed it was possible to create a contraption that would enable us to fly. And as a result of that, we had the aviation industry or you had people believing that it was possible to run a, a mile in under four minutes or believing that it was possible to run 100 meters in under 10 minutes. So just because of a belief, they were able to do something. And yet, where do our beliefs come from? Where do your beliefs about what you're able to do come from? Does it come from your boss? Does it come from society, what people have told you? This is the natural evolution of a belief system. Generally speaking, for most of us, parents, teachers, coaches, imam, minister, friends, relatives, older people around us as kids, they say, hey, this is fact, this is what's true. Oh, you're so good. Oh, you're terrible at this. Oh, you'll never amount to much. And we can internalize that. And then we consider that to, as a fact. Even if they're wrong, we say, hey, that's a fact. Um, we ingrain that. It becomes a habit in our minds. And then we grow up. And then as adults, we're walking around not even realizing that we've got faulty just ideas and beliefs inside of us. And yet, as I've said already, here's what you need to know. What goes on in your head is expressed in your actions and it impacts your relationships and results. And we've seen that story already, right? Because if in my head I'm feeling anxiety or depression or self-deprecation, then it shows up in Oh, it's, there's no point in me doing that, right? Because I'm not good at that anyway. And 
or there's fatigue, or there's a lethargy, and, and then in our relationships, we end up being angry and, and withdrawn, or we're careless, because we're already thinking, but I'm terrible at that anyway. And then at a physiological level, cortisol is flooding our body, the stress hormone. So we're in this constant state of fright, uh, flight. And so that's when we have the suicidal thoughts. That's when we have depleted financial reserves, energy reserves, poor productivity, all because of what's going on in our head. Now, the good news is that it can also work positively as we've explored, because if I'm feeling happy, if there's a sense of peace and there's a sense of self-compassion, then I'm relaxed, I'm more courageous, I'm more diligent. Then I show more care, more attention to things. I'm more engaged. And then that's a boost my mental health. It boosts my immune system. I've got more capacity. I've got more of a growth mindset. And I've got some incredible hormones just flooding through my body, making me feel happier. So if in our lives, and neuroscience has says 77% of our self-talk is negative, then how do we begin to change that? How do we move from planting negative thoughts in our minds to planting really positive thoughts that take root and really give us a robust core? What are you planting in your head? Are you planting the more negative, the insecurity, the doubt, the disbelief, or are you planting the optimistic, the joy, the courage, the gratitude? Here are three things that you can do just to develop more of a, uh, an optimum mental climate. So the power of visualization, visualizing yourself at your best, practicing positive affirmations. So Rachel already mentioned that earlier on, because if you say your mind is neutral, if you say to yourself, Obi, you're terrible, you'll never be good at this, the body will say, oh, great, you're terrible, you're never be good at this. But if you say, hey, you're learning, you can figure this out, you've got a growth mindset, get input, you can learn, then your body will say, hey, I can figure this out and learn the art of mindfulness. And speaking of mindfulness, Titi is going to go into that for the fourth strategy. Okay. There we go. Yeah, I'm, I'm back on. So mindfulness, the M word, as some of my students used to say to me, oh, no, not the M word, because they'd heard it so many times, you know, in different practices. And we all have different ideas of what mindfulness is. For some people, it might be meditation, it might be a religion, it might be a breathing exercise. However, John um, Kabat-Zinn, he developed a mindfulness-based stress reduction program over 30 years ago. So he was working with patients um, who were experiencing chronic pain in the hospitals. So he took many traditional and long established mindfulness practices and made them accessible to a wider audience. So it's almost like a westernized version of ancient practices, particularly in Asia. So we'll see in his definition that mindfulness is the awareness that arises from paying attention in a particular way on purpose in the present moment. And the important part is non-judgmentally. It seems really simple, you know, this practice, you know, because just to pause for a moment, because we have a puppy mind and trust me, I know what that really is now because we have a puppy in the house. He's always bringing shoes or toilet roll or one thing or the other that we didn't ask for, he's bringing to us. Or he's distracted at every moment thinking about this and that or, or I'm chewing something and next minute he wants to eat. So with our puppy minds, we're all over the place a lot of the time. So to be able to pause and just pay attention in the moment. So you're not dismissing what's happening to you. You're not saying, oh, no, I don't have this ailment. Oh, no, I don't have this emotion. Neither are you over identifying with it where it consumes you and you're hijacked by it that, and you start catastrophizing. You're simply observing what is happening in your body. Because the more you learn to do that, you lean into what's happening, the more you get to reframe or release the power of it. So on the next slide. So with Simon, he had to really learn this because it was such an alien concept to him, the idea of just 
pausing for a moment, you know, just like Obi said in the morning, he pauses just to think about what am I proud of? Just even having that moment in the morning before you go on autopilot and you're rushing to do all those different things is so important. Um, so mindfulness helps you to change from impulsive reactions to thoughtful reactions. Now, your sympathetic nervous system is there to help you with the fight, flight, freeze, fawn response. So your blood sugar increases, your sugar levels increase as well, your heartbeat elevates, you build up adrenaline and cortisol, and you come into a heightened state. When you have a mindful pause and you breathe, because kids always ask me, you know, well, of course I'm breathing already. No, because when you're on hijack, the prefrontal cortex, that problem solving, concentrating, um, clarifying, decision making part of your brain doesn't have enough oxygen because all the other parts of your body just hijacks all the oxygen so that it does all these things like build your blood pressure and your heartbeat, right? So you're in hijack. So when you breathe, a deep breath, you allow all that oxygen to be released and spread back into your prefrontal cortex where you can do your good thinking. So it's a really important part of stimulating your parasympathetic nervous system, which is more about rest and digesting. So where you have decreased blood pressure, your heartbeat regulates, dopamine releases the blocks of pain and you build in serotonin that makes you happy. So we want to breathe and pause so that you respond rather than react. How do we self-regulate? Let's look at our next slide. So Mark Brackett, who is a professor um, of emotional intelligence at Yale University, he wrote a book called Permission to Feel. If you have time, please read this book. It is such a beautiful book because he really talks about acknowledging your feelings and he gives this beautiful mood meter where we'll look at in a minute with a very nuanced vocabulary on emotional states. So the idea of the ruler method, and this is simple, you know, it's, it's a nice acronym, acronym that you can just use. You recognize your emotions, just as we said with Simon, try and understand the root causes, those unmet needs that he was experiencing. You label them because um, you're saying them out loud to release the power. You express these emotions according to cultural norms. This is important because in different environments, things mean different things. So in China, when I was living there, the word confrontation, the Chinese character for it is the same thing as conflict, right? Now for Chinese people reading that character, it's not um, any threat. It's just like, yeah, we're just saying things as, as it is. We're being direct. But for a Westerner, when you hear the word confrontation, you're like, whoa, that's a bit in your face. So it's important to know in con cultural contexts what different emotions mean, um, what different symbols mean. And this is important if you're in leadership, please diversify your leadership team. Because the more you have different people from all over the world, and even if you're in Africa, different people from different tribes, the more you learn to show empathy and express needs in your organization because you understand these different cultural norms, which then leads you to, of course, regulating. So let's do a little check-in with uh, our mood meter on the next slide. So with Simon, um, we had to look at when he was in high energy, low energy, low pleasantness and high pleasantness. Now, if you click on the various aspects, if you click again, you will see that um, Simon, in the beginning part, he was mainly in the blue zone. So with his loneliness, his tiredness, and this is where he was able to identify, okay, I am in burnout because he could identify these feelings. On the red zone, he was usually more in being furious and restless. And so can you imagine being in this place? And so with the mood meter, I often ask my clients, do it for a week and just let's see what the patterns are. But he was mainly in these two zones most of the week. And this was important for him because he was able to identify, well, no wonder um, <laughs> I'm struggling because if I'm constantly lonely, tired, exhausted, fatigued, then I'm not going to move much. With mindfulness and paying attention to his needs and building his toolbox, which I'll talk about in a minute, 
he was able to move to different places in his mood meter. So in the yellow zone and the green zone, he built himself to the point where he started to be more playful with his kids, similar to Obi's practice. Um, one of the things that I asked him to do every morning was hand on your heart, think about at least three things that you're grateful for every single day and just keep that up as a practice. And the more he did that, the more he felt a sense of balance and ease. And we'll look at some other things that he did as well. So the next strategy is from Daniel Siegel and it is name it to tame it. Again, with mindfulness, rather than dismissing what you're going through with those around you as well, we thank the emotion or the reaction and say, okay, your body is giving you back pain or it's giving you a shoulder pain. Thank you for giving me this shoulder pain because you're giving me a sign that I need to pay attention. Then you can also say to your body, I see what you're doing and you're reacting how you're supposed to react. However, I don't need this right now because I am safe, I am protected, and I am loved. So with me, with my cockroach, <laughs> as it comes and the thing is running towards me and my body is reacting, I'm like, hell, okay, <laughs> this is scary. But thank you because my body will do what it's supposed to do, which is I want to run away. However, in that moment, I can say I am safe, I am protected, and I am loved. And so these are strategies that Simon also learned that when he was restless, when he was irritable, rather than shaming himself and feeling guilty and saying, here I go again, I snapped up my kids again, or um, I've been withdrawing, or I've been drinking so much. It's like, well, I'm doing this for a reason. And let me look more into that. So the next slide is about the tech savvy world we live in and the thing that it impacts the most. So remember from our poll, sleeping late was one of the highest in the percentage, right? And this is such an, I mean, I could literally do a whole webinar on this. Um, with your amygdala, when you lack, when you have a lack of good sleep, it causes your amygdala to overreact. So good quality sleep affects learning and memory. It helps you have a healthy immune system. You have emotional balance and a positive mood. And also your digestive system works really well. So waste removal is quite fluid. When you lack sleep, you increase your chances of diabetes, high blood pressure, um, heart disease, heart attack, and stroke. I mean, less than six hours of sleep is often linked to weight gain as well. So it disrupts the balance of hormones in your body and it causes um, just a, a sense of almost hyperactivity or underactivity during the day. So really important. And, and this part, I always use gradual exposure therapy because with Simon, he was going to bed as late as two or three, because of course it's the quiet time where everybody's asleep and this is where he could do his work. So rather than giving him this tall order that he can't achieve and go to bed at nine or go to bed at 10, we gradually exposed him to, okay, tomorrow let's aim just for one week, aim to go to bed at one. Then the next week, go to bed at 12. The goal being that he gets to bed at 11, 1130 and tries to make that consistent even just for three days. And over time, when he started to notice the benefits, he was like, you know what? I like the way I feel in the morning. I feel more refreshed. I feel more balanced. I feel like I, I can achieve more. And it wasn't cold turkey. So he was able to more or less move his sleep down to latest 12 o'clock um, consistently for four to five days, right? So it's always good to give yourself an out and to build up changing your habits gradually. So on the next slide, how do we access these beautiful, happy hormones? Um, it's important to know what the benefits are of these chemicals that are going through your body. Because when you know that, oh, actually, when I complete a task, boom, that's a dopamine uh, reward that I'm getting there. Now, of course, dopamine being that um, hormone that comes with rewards is the same with alcohol or with texting as Obi mentioned or the, the likes on social media. We've seen that every time you see a like, you want that hit again, right? And we stay up late for the likes, um, for 
just all the things that we have on social media, but there are other ways we can get this dopamine, you know, by celebrating the little wins, like Obi said, I'm proud of what have I, I've achieved. Um, with sexual intimacy, that's also another one. I mean, sexual intimacy is in all of them, as you can see. And this is really important for children, for those of you who have children, or if you grew up without affection, I know some people find touch difficult, depending on their experience. But it's also important to see that there are other ways that you can get oxytocin, which is the love hormone, by a handshake or a hug or a touch. Even when your kids are older, they still need touch, you know, so as much as possible, you know, if you can keep giving them that type of touch. Okay, so the next slide. This part is about self-compassion. And um, just like, you know, what Obi was sharing earlier about his friend, I imagined that as he was going through this cycle of burnout in his mind where he had to run away, there was a lot that he was lacking with self-compassion, you know? Um, the gremlins in his mind and his brain would have been on overdrive. And so these are some questions to just ask yourself, you know, can you practice regret without falling into a dark hole? Can you take responsibility without blaming yourself where you beat yourself up at to the point where it's so debilitating? Can someone do something nice for you without wondering, ah, what did they want? Why are they being so nice to me? Maybe because you don't feel deserving. Maybe because you don't feel worthy of accepting those gifts. And are you able to be okay even when someone hurts you? That's a big one, forgiveness. Forgiveness, as they say, is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. Forgiveness doesn't mean you, it, you need to reconcile with the person. Forgiveness is for you. Forgiveness is for your heart and to help you not be in that state of bondage with whatever it is that that person has done for you, but to be able to release it by acknowledging it first, validating that it's there, expressing it, using the ruler method to get it all out, but then allowing yourself compassion. So this is something we had to do with Simon. On the next slide, you'll see some of the things that he was saying to himself. I love Jim Quick's definition of self-talk. So your brain is a computer and your self-talk is the program it will run. Unfortunately, our self-talk is multi-dimensional because it could be self-talk from yourself and it could be what was passed down from your parents. Remember I said about the brain waves of your mom connected to your heartbeat and water keeping um, a memory of your thoughts and emotions from generations. So if this happened in the old days and it's happening for yourself now, it keeps you in this place where um, that dark hole, it keeps you in that dark hole. When you're able to acknowledge that and reframe the self-talk, and this is sometimes they say, some people don't like the statement, but fake it till you make it. <laughs> You don't have to believe it, right? Your subconscious mind is the most susceptible part to any information that you put into your brain. It's formed sort of around like when you're seven. And so if you say to yourself, I'm good enough, I'm capable, I'm lovable, I'm worthy, I matter, your subconscious mind will start to believe it. So you don't even have to say to yourself, you can be listening to um, a meditation on an app, or you can be listening to a sermon, or you can be listening to anything that has good intentions in it, and it will go into your subconscious mind. So build on your self-talk with, with your compassion. It's so important. You know, when you get into that place with the shame gremlins where they want to tell you, oh, you're an imposter and you're a failure. You can acknowledge that because we name it to tame it, right? We don't dismiss it. You acknowledge those thoughts and then you reframe them with empowering beliefs. Okay, the last check-in. This is something I normally do at the beginning of my sessions with my clients actually. And it's just a check-in, another one similar to the burnout and stress one. How are you doing with your hydration? Put a number on there. You know, we're made up of water, 60 to 70%. So we constantly need to revitalize ourselves with at least two liters of water. I say that 
I'm coughing because man, <laughs> I, I can do, oh, there you go. He's drinking his, yes. <laughs> One liter I can do, but two, anyway. But that's what you need just to um, revitalize your body. Then your fitness, it doesn't have to be a lot. It could be a walk. 10 minutes. We live such a sedentary lifestyle, especially with all that's happened in the world with COVID. We're sitting a lot. So we need to move it to lose it. Put a number on there. How's it going with that, with nutrition? These days, you know, we tend to have to supplement because um, the food we eat doesn't have the same density of nutrients that it, as it did 100 years ago. So it's okay to supplement if you need to. Ideally, it's better to get it from food, but check your diet and you know, check what fuels you and what drains you sleep patterns, we just talked about that. Just check in, how's that going? You know, um, is it late nights? Um, does that affect you the next day in your hormones? We check that relaxation, your relationships. Um, meaningful contribution is the big one. You know, do you have time to actually do things for your community that resonate with your heart, right? Fun and passions, that's usually the one that my clients find difficult. As they say in Africa, body no be wudo. All walk and no play makes Johnny a what? Uh -huh. You know, so it's important to have fun and do things that you're passionate about. When you are in flow, you have less resentment in your workplace and in your relational environment. But when you're not in flow, it, it builds up in your family life as well, you know, you, and, and you're not doing the things you love because of all the responsibilities you have. That's what took Simon to a place where he was just on shutdown. So he couldn't connect with his heart because he wasn't doing things that he loved. And so he couldn't connect with it, the people around them, around him and their hearts. So check in with yourself, you know, what is something fun that you like to do? Okay, so toolbox, our final slide. What's in your toolbox? Some of these things are free of charge. Some of these things you invest in. These are some of mine just to give you an example. With Simon, we had to build a toolbox. And in all those aspects I just showed you, you know, with his relaxation, with his family connection. Now, at night, I have a different role. I am a DJ by night and African party planner. So I love Afrobeats. In fact, when it was COVID um, and there was not, no way to meet with people to dance, so I, I just put my, my headphones on and I started dancing on the streets and people look like, who is this woman? <laughs> Sometimes people will join me. Some people just look at me like, what the heck? She has red hair or blue hair or purple hair. And she's just dancing, but I'm like, I just want to enjoy myself. Hey, and I look at them like, oh yeah, <laughs> because it was free of charge. <clears throat> and I know I need it for my well being. So we need to connect with our inner child and be playful because when you're in that heart space of play, oh my gosh, everything else flows. You know, you feel motivated, you feel energized. So think about that, um, what's in your toolbox. Get well-versed about what's in the toolbox of your partners and your children. Oh my gosh, can you imagine in the workplace if we all knew each other's well-being toolbox and we knew when people were drained or burnt out, but we knew what they needed to revitalize themselves and we even surprised them with some of those things. Think about how different our environments will be. So I hope that's given you some ideas and some tools. Please share with us um, any questions you might have and Alexander will take over our Q&A session. Hello. Yes, I hope I'm um, coming through clearly. Yes. Okay, uh, well, that was really an amazing session and uh, I think our audience definitely learned a lot, benefited a lot. I could see already in the comments people's reactions and uh, thank you to Salayo, thank you Obi. Um, so we're now moving into a Q&A session just to give our audience a chance to interact with our speakers. 
And we'll do this by just raising your hand and indicating that you have a question. Or you can also put your questions in the chat and I'll do my best to sort through them and, and put them forward to the speakers. It's also possible that you are just taking it in and need to digest it and that's okay too. I will answer a logistics question because some people are asking about the recording. We will share the recording with everyone that are registered. So that'll come through. 